Supreme Forbearance, Uttam Kshama Forbearance, that is forgiveness, is the nature of the self. By taking shelter of the forgiving nature of the self, the state of serenity which is devoid of anger emerges in the self. This also is called forgiveness. Although the self is itself of the forgiving nature, even then since beginningless period, the state of anger, which is devoid of forbearance, is existing in the soul. Whenever discussions or seminars on the ten religions are held, their definitions are given in the negative forms only. It is said that absence of anger is forgiveness, absence of pride is modesty, absence of deceitfulness is straightforwardness, etc. Is religion really of negative nature? Is there no positive form or disposition of it? If yes, why is it not interpreted in the form of positive dispositions? One does not know as to how negations such as don't get angry, don't boast, abstain from deceit, do no violence, don't indulge in stealing, etc. have been included in religion. Is religion the name of denials only? Is there no positive side of it? Though the renouncement of other objects is preached in religion, yet in no lesser way is the act of self-absorption included along with it. This is not to be done, that is not to be done, is the language of ties. When an aspirant of liberation, desirous of getting released from all ties, hears about the long list of bondages, even in the name of religion, he gets perplexed. He thinks that he had come here in search of the liberation from bondages, but here he is getting tied with various restrictions. Religion is the name of freedom. How could it be a religion wherein the talk of infinite ties is found? Do, then, the restrictions mean religion? Is religion of negative nature? No, the intrinsic nature of the substance is called its religion, and hence it is verily of positive nature and not of negative nature. But, alas, our language is reversed. In place of telling absence of anger is forgiveness, absence of pride is modesty, why don't we speak this way? Absence of forgiveness is anger, absence of modesty is pride, absence of straightforwardness is deceit and etc. Just think, whether the absence of knowledge is ignorance or the absence of ignorance is knowledge. Gyan is the root word. By prefixing a to it for conveying negative sense, a gyan word is made. It is therefore automatically proved that the absence of knowledge is ignorance. The intrinsic nature of a substance is assuredly its religion and the modification identical to that very nature that is natural substantial modification is also named as religion. Right belief, right knowledge and right conduct being the natural substantial modifications are verily the religion. The alienated modifications are called unreligion. Knowledge is the intrinsic nature of the soul substance, hence it is its religion. The right modification of knowledge is also called knowledge. Therefore, right knowledge is also religion. The perverse modification of knowledge, that is a gyan, in the contrary disposition of the soul, it is therefore unreligion. Similarly, forgiveness is the nature of the self. It is therefore assuredly the religion and the natural modification evolved by taking shelter of the forgiving nature of the self is also religion. But when the forgiving nature of the self does not modify into forgiveness but manifests into contradistinction, then that contrary modification is called anger. Anger is a contradistinction of the self and it emerges in the absence of forgiveness. Although, from continuity point of view, it is existing from beginningless time, nevertheless, it is produced every moment as a new and newer modification. Hence, the fact is that the absence of forgiveness is anger, but it is usually said that the absence of anger is forgiveness. The reason for this is that from beginningless time, the soul has never modified into its forgiving nature but has been modifying into alien states of anger, etc. When it obtains the natural states of forgiveness, anger comes to an end. Therefore, the above statement is made. 
because the modifications for forgiveness is found emerging in the absence of anger. If its usage is considered like knowledge, then it can be said this way. Absence of knowledge is ignorance. Absence of forgiveness is non-forgiveness. Absence of modesty is immodesty. Absence of straightforwardness is discordance or deceit, and etc. As nobody says, don't indulge in ignorance, but instead says, attain knowledge. Why then it is not said, observe forgiveness in place of saying, don't be angry. This also has got a reason, and it is this, that we are all well acquainted with anger, pride, deceit, etc. These are our continuously experienced contrary modifications. Forbearance, etc. are known to us, and we have no experience of the same. As a matter of fact, turning from recognized to unrecognized and from experienced to inexperienced is a natural process. People do not dispute when it is said that forgiveness is not to indulge in anger. But if they are told that anger is not to forgive, then it sounds something unusual and nothing is understood. Therefore, the definition of anger is always explained in the affirmative form. Example, resentment is called wrath. When wrath emerges, the eyes become red, body starts shivering, lips start pulsating, etc. Here, a question may arise that the Acharyas have also adopted this way of explanation. Yes, the Acharyas too had a problem. They had to explain forgiveness to angry persons. Therefore, forgiveness too had to be explained through the medium of anger. A layman has to be explained through his conventional language. The preceptors are people with huge stock of forbearance. If they talk from their experience, they will say that absence of forbearance is anger. But in the world, the speaker has to use the language of the listener to explain his concept. If one does not speak in the language of the listener, the listener will not be able to follow anything. Hence, though the enlightened souls want to explain the virtue of forbearance, they explain it through the talk of anger. To have a talk with children, one has to speak from their angle. When we say to a child, call mother, then at that time our intention is to call the child's mother and not our mother. We know that by telling this, the child will call his mother and not our mother. Likewise, when we have to explain forbearance through the language of anger, it would be better to explain clearly anger first. Although the soul is a solid mass, that is partless embodiment of knowledge and bliss, by nature, it is an absolutely perfect entity. But some contradistinctions, impure emotions, weaknesses are assimilated with it from beginningless time, since when it is existing. The scripturalists have given many names to those weaknesses, such as contradistinctions, passions, emotions and so on. In no less way, sermons are given to abdicate them. Their abandonment has been preached as the means of attaining real happiness. In spite of innumerable sermons and instructions of the enlightened souls, the mundane souls could not escape from these weaknesses. Due to these weaknesses, the mundane souls have suffered from severe calamities, are suffering and will suffer. Also, to get rid of them, no efforts have been spared, yet the situation has remained unchanged. The impure feelings, weaknesses and passions due to which the mundane souls remained unsuccessful even after reaching very near to the door of success and could not reach at the summit of happiness and peace even after making incessant efforts, amongst those evils, in these weaknesses, in those passions, the greatest evil, the greatest weakness and the greatest passion is anger. Anger is souls such a vitiated state, such a weakness that due to it, wisdom is destroyed and power of recognizing good or bad disappears. The angry man starts uttering nonsense words, starts abusing and beating the object of his anger and wants to harm it in any way, even at the cost of his own life. Even if any of his well-wisher or an esteemed person tries to quieten him, he starts abusing him also and gets ready even to kill him. 
if after all this the person could not be harmed then he himself becomes extremely unhappy starts cutting the parts of his own body starts breaking his own head and even commits suicide by taking poison and etc most of the murders and suicides that take place in the world are results of highly excited states of anger thus anger is the greatest enemy of the soul angry man always finds faults with the object of his anger and becomes unmindful of his own faults even when thinking dispassionately he finds himself to be at fault but when does the angry person do self introspection it is his blindness that his eyes are always on the others and that too on the existent or non existent evils in others he has no eyes to see the virtues of others if he could see the virtues of others how could he then be angry with them rather he will develop respect towards them if the glass tumbler gets broken by the tumble of the owner's own feet he will still cry in anger who has put the glass tumbler over here in the middle of the way he will get angry with the person who has put the tumbler but not with his own self it will never occur to him as to why did he not move carefully if the tumbler gets broken with the tumble of the attendant's feet he will frown on him by exclaiming why don't you move carefully are you blind in such a situation he will get angry with the person who broke it and not with his own self although he himself might have kept the tumbler in the middle of the way fault will always be seen of the attendant even if the owner himself struck it or maybe it got struck by the attendant's feet whether he himself had kept it there or it was kept by the attendant if someone tells him that as he himself kept the tumbler and he himself struck it why did he scold the attendant even then he will say the attendant should have removed it from there why did he not remove it from there he cannot visualize his own fault because the angry person always sees others faults if he could visualize his own fault how would then anger arise This is the reason why acharyas have termed the angry man as anger blinded. What remains undone by an anger blinded person in the whole world whatever acts of destruction are committed by mankind the perverted feelings of anger and etc are only found to be the root cause of such destruction. The destruction of the fully developed and prosperous city of Dwaraka occurred only due to wrathfulness of saint Dwipai and Muni. Hundreds of houses and families can be seen ruined because of wrathfulness. What more to say? In the world, whatsoever appears to be bad is the result of evils like anger and etc. As stated in Atmanushasan verse number 216, Krodho dayad bhavati kasya na karyahani. In the operative state of wrathfulness, whose work does not get harmed? That is, all are harmed. Acharya Ram Chandra Shukla an erudite scholar of hindi literature has nicely analyzed this point in his essay on krodh anger is a psychic emotion which disturbs peace it not only disturbs the mental peace of the angry person but also makes the environment vitiated and perturbed towards whomsoever anger is shown he at once feels insulted and also gets badly irritated due to the sorrow thus evolved these are very rare people who think or exercise their mind to find out the appropriateness or otherwise about the expression of anger a very dangerous form of anger is the feeling of revenge the feeling of revenge is a more dangerous psychic emotion as compared to anger in fact it is a vitiated form of anger the feeling of revenge is the jam of anger under the influence of anger we think of taking revenge immediately we not only think but start taking revenge instantly in angry mood we start abusing and beating the person whom we consider our enemy but if we do not show or express any reaction immediately and keep the feeling of anger suppressed in the mind against the object of anger with the intention that it is not the right time now and we may be at a loss if we attack him now because the enemy is strong and on getting opportunity we will take revenge then that anger gets converted into the form of the feeling of revenge 
and it remains buried for many years and reappears when the opportunity for revenge occurs. Apparently, in comparison to anger, this cleverness seems to be less harmful, but it is more dangerous than anger because this amounts to planned destruction, whereas anger is not based on any plan for destruction. It works instantly in whatever way possible. The planned destruction is more dangerous and dreadful than ordinary unplanned destruction. Although the spirit of revenge does not seem to possess that degree of intensity and severity as is seen in anger, yet the period of anger is much less, whereas the feeling of revenge continues even generation after generation. Anger is found in many other forms also. Grumbling, irritation and annoyance etc. are also the forms of anger. Whenever we don't like someone's talk or work, and that thing is brought to our notice repeatedly, we start grumbling. The repeated feeling of grumbling changes into irritation. The grumbling and irritation are the consequences of unsuccessful anger. These may be regarded as the miniature forms of anger. Annoyance is also a dormant form of anger. All these maladies are minor or intense forms of anger only. All are destroyers of mental peace, are obstructions in the way to greatness. So as long as these exist, none can be great, nor can one achieve perfection. If we want to be great and wish to achieve perfection, these will have to be conquered. But how to do that? In this context, the words of Pandit Todar Malji are worth noting. Due to ignorance, so long as other substances will continue to appear to us as useful or harmful, maladies like anger etc. will continue to take birth. But, when through engrossed study of reality, the feeling of like and dislike in other substances will disappear, then anger will naturally not take birth. The sum and substance of all this is that the root cause of the origination of anger etc. is the belief that other substances are the causes of our happiness and unhappiness. When we begin examining the cause of our happiness and unhappiness in ourselves and hold ourselves to be responsible for them, on whom shall we express our anger? The root cause of the origination of anger etc. is to believe that others are the cause of our good or bad incidents, happiness and unhappiness. The word supreme prefixed to forbearance indicates the existence of right belief. Forbearance found with right belief is assuredly supreme forbearance. A question may arise here that since forbearance is related with the absence of anger, What relativity has it got with right belief? Why is there this compulsory condition that supreme forbearance cannot be possessed by an ignorant self? Whosoever is not empowered by anger be treated as the holder of supreme forbearance, irrespective of the fact whether he is a true believer or a false believer. In reality, the thing is that anger disappears only by taking shelter of the self. An ignorant self does not take shelter of the self. Hence, absence of anger cannot be found in him. Therefore, it is not possible that an ignorant self can be devoid of anger. If apparently he is not found to be indulging in anger, it does not mean that inwardly he is devoid of anger. Maybe there is no outward expression of anger. Because sometimes when anger is dormant, its manifestation is not apparent to the eyes. The ignorant selves take this to be absence of anger and start believing it to be the supreme forbearance. In fact, it is not the state of supreme forbearance, but it is a delusion about supreme forbearance. The question now arises as to why can't an ignorant self be devoid of anger? Why is he always found indulging in infinite anger? The answer to this question is that due to fallacious feeling of doership instinct in other substances, anantanubandhi krodh, that is the intensest type of anger, takes birth. When the other substance does not modify or change as per his will, he gets irritated on it. This would mean that in the universe, All other substances which do not modify or change as per one's will shall be the object of his anger. All other substances are infinite in number, 
Hence, according to his belief, the infinite number of other substances will become the object of his anger. This is what is called Anantanubandhi Krodh, the intensest type of anger, because in intention he has bound himself with infinite number of other substances. Thus, we see that the fallacious feeling of doership in other substances exists in the ignorant self. Due to this, his emotions, anger, etc. may appear to have subsided. But, so long as his intensest type of passion does not come to an end, how can the supreme forbearance, that is religion, emerge in him? Secondly, the ten religions, that is supreme forbearance, etc. are nothing but the manifestations of the right self-conduct. And the right self-conduct does not manifest in the absence of right belief. It is, therefore, self-evident that supreme forbearance, etc. religions cannot manifest in an ignorant self. From a realistic point of view, when by taking shelter of the forgiving nature of the self, the malady of resentment does not arise. It is called supreme forbearance. But from the practical point of view, not to get excited even in the presence of the instrumental causes of anger, and not to indulge in counteractions against the object of anger is also called supreme forbearance. In Dashalakshan Pujan, the great poet Dhyanatraya, while explaining supreme forbearance, has said, Gali sunamana khedana ano, gunko augun kahe bakhano, kahi hai bakhano vastu chine, bandh maar bahu vidhi kare, gharatay nikare tan vidare, in the above-mentioned verse, it is stated that one who can keep quiet even in the presence of contrariety of instrumental causes is the true possessor of supreme forbearance. He is the supreme forgiver who does not feel irritated even though abused. Many people are found saying, Although by nature I am calm and quiet, but if someone teases me, then I can't keep quiet. To such people, my question is, show me such a person who gets angry while we are praising him. When being praised, people feel elated rather than being angry. He alone is the true possessor of forbearance who does not get angry even when abused. Here, our attention is drawn to a higher level of thinking. What to talk of the intensity of anger when, in the mind, even the slightest anxiety is not produced, forbearance is said to exist there. Due to some external factors, one may not exhibit anger, but if he internally gets irritated, then also, how can he be found possessed with forbearance? For instance, the owner reprimanded his accountant. Then, due to the fear of getting terminated from service, the agent did not exhibit anger. But if he internally got irritated, then also one cannot call it to be the state of forbearance. The expression Gali Sunman Khedana Anav is meant to emphasize this. One who slaps back on being abused is physically an evil doer. One who reciprocates abuses on being abused is vocally an evil doer. And one who feels irritated in the mind on listening to abuses is an evil doer mentally. But the one who does not get irritated even mentally is a true possessor of forbearance. Further ahead it is stated, Gun ko gun kahe bakhano, that is, though we might be possessing good qualities, yet the opponent may describe them to be bad qualities, and that too not privately but in the public meeting during deliverance of a lecture. Now, even then, if we do not get irritated and agitated, we are the possessors of forbearance. Some people say, Friends, we may tolerate abuses, but how are we to tolerate those evil traits which are not at all in us, but are being mentioned as being found in us? Moreover, if those are uttered privately or separately, we may anyhow tolerate. But if uttered in the public meeting, in the midst of a lecture, it is then but natural that we get irritated and agitated. The poet is elaborating this very theme that if resentment arises, it is not forbearance but is assuredly anger. Suppose resentment does not arise during that moment also, and we may start thinking, abusers abuse, let them abuse, why should we bother? 
but what to do when he starts snatching our things we may not become resentful even when our things are being snatched but when he ties us beats us and starts troubling in many other ways what to do then in reply to this question the poet has said vastu chine bandh mar bahu vidhi kare in the words bahu vidhi kare there is a lot of hidden meaning try to draw as much meaning out of it as you can nowadays many new ways of torturing have been discovered when foreign spies are arrested various types of inhumanly tortures for knowing the secret things of enemies are inflicted on them such which one cannot even imagine all those are covered under the words bahu vidhi kare even then if one does not get irritated supreme forbearance will reign there the poet wants to say this the topic does not end here it goes further gharate nakare tan vidare bair jona tahadhare suppose any cruel person after torturing in various ways goes away then at least we can take rest at home and can take treatment but if he kicks us out of our home also what to do then even when expelled out of our home if our physique is all right we may somewhere and somehow by doing some work can earn livelihood and pass time but when he kicks us out of our home and also inflicts serious injuries on our body resentment will naturally arise no friend even in such circumstances resentment does not arise there exists supreme forbearance but no not even then suppose no resentment is exhibited but we tie a knot in the mind and nurse the feeling of enmity even then also supreme forbearance is not to be found there much has already been said about anger and enmity earlier anger is exhibited and enmity is retained in the mind that is in anger some immediate reaction takes place but in enmity a knot of revenge or enmity is tied in the mind enmity is like fire wherever fire will be kept it will burn the container first and later on it may or may not burn the other things therefore enmity too burns him first who holds it the object of enmity may or may not be a prey to it because everybody's good or bad fortune depends upon one's own auspicious or inauspicious karmas and operation therefore this absence of anger along with the absence of enmity is called supreme forbearance but all this discussion is from empirical that is vyavahar point of view from the real that is nishchay point of view mere non appearance of the actions of anger even in the adverse circumstances is not supreme forbearance it is just possible that outwardly the indulgence in anger etc may not be seen and inwardly the anger enemy of supreme forbearance may be existing or in the inner realm of spirit partial supreme forbearance may be existing and even then outwardly the actions of anger etc may be found therefore to understand real supreme forbearance we have to go further deep in the scriptures anger is described to be of four types one intensest type of anger that is anantanubandhi krodh which leads to infinite births and deaths two intenser type of anger that is apratyakhyana varniya krodh which hinders partial abstinence three intense type of anger that is pratyakhyana varniya krodh which hinders complete abstinence and four mild type of anger that is sanjwalan krodh which hinders absolute conduct anantanubandhi krodh is found absent in an enlightened vowless soul of the fourth spiritual stage therefore the state of supreme forbearance of that degree is obtainable in him the supreme forbearance of the order of the absence of anantanubandhi and apratyakhyana varan types of anger is manifested in an enlightened soul who observes partial vows of the fifth spiritual state similarly the naked possessionless saints who observe complete vows of the sixth and seventh spiritual stages are the possessors of supreme forbearance which emerges in the absence of the three types of anger namely anantanubandhi apratyakhyanavaran and pratyakhyanavaran 
the naked possessionless saints of very high spiritual stages are the possessors of complete supreme forbearance that is the ninth and tenth spiritual stage holders the above statement is made in the scriptural language therefore only the ardent readers of scriptures will be able to follow it the purport of all this is that the virtues of supreme forbearance etc cannot be measured externally supreme forbearance does not depend upon the high and low degrees of the passions its basis is the gradual dissociation from the aforesaid passions that discrimination which is based on the subsidence and severity of passions is termed as lesha although empirically the low passion souls are also termed as the possessors of supreme forbearance and etc but from the inward vision point of view it is also possible that externally one may appear to be totally calm and quiet but internally may be having infinite anger that is possessing anantanabandhi krodh the wrong faith naked possessionless saint who may be born in the ninth gravyak may outwardly appear calm and quiet to such an extent that even by removing his skin and pouring salt into it the edge of his eyes may not get red with anger even then in the eyes of the scripture writers he is not the true possessor of supreme forbearance but is having infinite anger anantanubandhi krodh because anger in the form of disinterest of the self soul has not vanished from his inner self the reason for the absence of anger outwardly is not the natural peace resulting from taking shelter of the soul but the contemplation which has kept them calm and quiet is assuredly a result of dependence on the other substances for example they ponder as i have become a saint i must remain unperturbed if i will not remain calm what would people say about me in this birth i will be defamed and will undergo the bondage of sins which will spoil the next birth also if i will remain calm i will be praised here and now and will incur the bondage of punya that is auspicious karmas which will produce delight in future thus the foundation of their peace is either some kind of greed for fame or the fear of being defamed or interest in punya karmas and disinterest in pap karmas or because it is written in the scripture that a saint must never get angry he should remain peaceful and etc they remain peaceful by clinging to some such external base they do not make their own soul as a basis of peace moreover if under the influence of charitra moha karma any enlightened self is found indulging in anger externally even then he may be possessing supreme forbearance for example suppose the chief of the saints is seen scolding a saint and inflicting punishment on him and outwardly looking in an excited and angry mood even then he continues to possess supreme forbearance because anantanabandhi a pratyakhyana varan and pratyakhyana varan types of anger are totally absent in him and he enjoys the shelter of the self a right faith householder the one who is either observing partial vows or not observing any vows may be seen outwardly indulging in high degree of anger bharat chakravarti although a non votary but possessing kshayak samyak darshan while throwing the circular weapon on bahubali was not having anger on the order of anantanubandhi therefore the existence of supreme forbearance cannot be judged on the basis of one's external activities supreme forbearance manifests only in the absence of anantanubandhi type of anger in the absence of apratyakhyana varan and pratyakhyana varan type of anger it is further enriched and the absence of sanjwalan type of anger leads it to perfection anantanubandhi anger the binding force of infinite mundane lives is the other name for disinterest towards the self soul in other words the disinterest towards the self soul which is by nature an embodiment of knowledge and bliss is called anantanubandhi krodh when we nurse infinite anger against any person we don't like even to see his face nor like to talk to him or listen to anything about him if any third person talks about him we cannot tolerate even that 
then the question of lending our ears to his praise does not arise similarly those who have not developed interest towards realizing the self soul those who are perverse to listening to the talk of the self soul those who dislike not only the talk of the self but also the persons who discuss the matter relating to the self all of them possess anger of anantanubandhi type because they have infinite anger against the self soul that's why they dislike any talk about the self soul we have excused others many times but have never paid attention to the advice of acharyas who admonish us to pardon at least once our self soul to look at it and to remember it since beginning last time we have spent infinite time only in trying and testing others the acharyas assure us that if we at least see know and introspect once our own self the supreme forbearance will naturally get manifested in us self realization is the only real means of achieving supreme forbearance supreme forbearance is manifested in that enlightened soul which realizes the self it grows in them only who grow their power of self realization and it obtains perfection only in those souls who totally remain engrossed in the soul itself infinitely the difference in supreme forbearance amongst avirat samyak drishti anuvrati shravak mahavrati muni and arhant bhagwan is quantitative but not qualitative supreme forbearance is not of two types although it is discussed in two ways the stages of adopting it in one's life may be even more than two nischay kshama and vyavahar kshama are merely the kinds of style of narration and not of supreme forbearance likewise the forbearance of a vowless right faith self of a votary shravak observing partial conduct as of a saint observing complete conduct and that of an omniscient lord all these are the type of stages of manifesting forbearance in one's life and not of supreme forbearance it is one and indivisible supreme forbearance is a passionless desireless pure positive aspect of the self it is not passional not a kind of attachment and not even any auspicious or inauspicious type of feeling as a matter of fact it is devoid of all these non spiritual states i conclude this discussion with the pious spirit that all living beings may achieve supreme forbearance by taking shelter of the forgiving nature of soul and may all achieve perfect bliss by engrossing in the self soul the embodiment of knowledge